Uh, can you hear me back there? Is this working? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Congressman Roscoe Bartlett is the reason most of us are here, actually. You know, he's the guy that uh, held the first unclassified hearings on electromagnetic pulse, which prior to that time, you know, was largely classified and uh, brought it out into the light of day for the public and a lot of most policymakers to know about what a uh, dire threat this was, even though it had been, you know, known to the Department of Defense and to the intelligence community, you know, for 50 years. And he's the guy that started the uh, Congressional EMP Commission and kept it going, you know, which came up with solutions to this and uh, is basically the, the baseline study for the uh, understanding this threat. Uh, you know, being aware of the threat, we owe it to Mr. Bartlett. And if we ever get this country protected, and God, God pray God we do, we'll owe it to Mr. Bartlett too. So, Mr. Bartlett, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's generally agreed that there are four things that could take down the grid. A nuclear detonation above the atmosphere, a uh, giant solar storm, which will occur. We may avoid the others, but we can't avoid that one. That will occur. A, a cyber attack or a physical terrorist attack. And if the grid goes down, there is a general uh, consensus that it would probably, surges of electricity, if the grid goes down, will probably take out a lot of our major transformers, maybe 100, 150 or so of them. If that happens, the grid will be down for a year or more because we have very few spares. We don't make any of them. Those that make them have essentially no spares. So if you need one, you order it. They will make it in a year, year and a half, you will have one. That's a year or more without electricity. This ends life as we know it. If you think about those 16 critical infrastructures there. Now the innocence and ignorance on these matters in the general public is astounding. And we have a truly representative Congress. You can't imagine how difficult it was for Dr. Peter Pry and uh, I to, uh, to get the EMP Commission going. They really didn't want to do it. And we don't have time today to talk about what we had to do to get that going, but it wasn't easy in the Congress to, to get that thing going. By the way, uh, we asked for the latest paper on EMP from the CIA, and they gave us Dr. Pry's paper of a decade ago. That's how little attention was being, was being uh, uh, paid uh, uh, to this. For 20 years, I drove down the road, 50 miles down and 50 miles back every day to Washington, and I passed, I don't know how many millions of houses, some of them many, many times. And in those whole 20 years of driving back and forth, I saw one house burning, one, that was right across the road from my farm. Now, every one of those homeowners had a fire insurance policy, and yet the probability of their home burning was very, very low. And it wouldn't end life as you know it if your home burned. It would be catastrophic for you financially and so forth, but you'd still be here. And the sun would still come up and go down and things would be quite normal. But if there's an EMP attack, that won't be true. And I'm having some trouble understanding the psychology. That you couldn't put your head on the pillow at night without having your home uh, insured for fire. And yet, millions of Americans go to bed every night, and they've made essentially no preparation for an event which could end life as they know it. What do we do? The first thing we need to do is education. People need to understand the possibility, the probability of this threat, and what the consequences would be. And then we need to have action at every conceivable level. You and your family ought to be doing something, not just some food storage. Sustainable preparation, please. You know, three months of food, that's awfully easy to store. 50 pounds of rice at Sam's Cubs costs $16.44. You can store a lot of calories for very little. But then what do you do? What do you do if the stores don't open in three months or however long you have your food stored for? You need to be sustainably prepared. You need to work with your social group, whatever it is, your club, your church. You need to work with them to be prepared. You need to work with your city or your township to be prepared. Your state needs to be prepared. And by the way, probably the most difficult level to get prepared at is the federal level. You know, we've worked now for 20 years, Peter and I, at that level. Very, very difficult. Maybe the states can do it. Maine is already there. I understand North Carolina is going to be there shortly. But we need education. We need to be working at every one of these levels because if this occurs, and it will occur, I shouldn't say if, 
it will occur. There will be another Carrington event. There will be another giant solar storm. If we haven't prepared, it will end life as we know it. You, I can't tell you how gratifying it is to see all you people here, because 20 years ago, there wasn't a single person in the Congress other than Peter Pry and myself who had any interest in or concern about this subject. Thank you very much for your contribution to this. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Congressman Bartlett. That's a hell of an act to follow. Thanks a lot, Chuck. <laughs> you know, Chuck has asked me in, uh, to introduce myself and to give you a, uh, an overview, a net assessment, as it were, of the evolving EMP threat and of the progress or lack of progress to protect the country in uh, five minutes. So I'm going to try to do that. Uh, Dr. Peter Vincent Pry, I think most of you already know me, worked in the CIA. You've already heard from Mr. Bartlett. So enough of that. What is the bottom line in terms of the net assessment? Well, we have made tremendous progress. And given how few of us and how little resources we have, you know, to try to get this country protected, it's really amazing the progress we've made. And yet every year, you know, when I sort of deliver a net assessment, uh, the threat is evolving faster than our efforts to buy that insurance policy that Dr. Bartlett, Congressman Bartlett was talking about. You know, you start with the sun. You know, we are in the solar maximum. And uh, we could tomorrow get struck by a Carrington-class geomagnetic uh, solar flare that could cause a geomagnetic superstorm. And in fact, uh, such a solar flare, there have been several of them emitted by the sun during this solar maximum, including uh, a little over a year, a year ago, in July 2012, th there was one that narrowly crossed the path of the Earth and just narrowly missed the Earth. Had that hit the Earth, it would have created a Carrington-class geomagnetic superstorm that would have collapsed electrical grids worldwide and put billions of lives at risk. The Congressional EMP Commission estimated that given a cur nation's current state of unpreparedness, nine of 10 Americans could die from starvation, disease, and societal collapse given a blackout that lasts a year. What about the man-made threat? Well, uh, in March uh, of this year, uh, North Korea threatened to make nuclear strikes on uh, the United States, South Korea, and Japan. And this was just four months after they demonstrated the capability to put a satellite in orbit in such a way, the height of that satellite and the orbit that it was a, looked exactly like a practicing for an EMP attack. And North Korea is assessed by the EMP Commission to have a super EMP warhead. You know, just four months after they demonstrated the capability to do it, they were threatening to attack this country. It just shows how aggressive and unstable and possibly insane the regime's leadership is in North Korea and how unpredictable they are. Then, uh, a few months after that, uh, you know, we intercepted that North Korean freighter trying to transit the Panama Canal, suspected of drug smuggling. Found two SA-2 nuclear-capable missiles on launchers in the hold of that freighter. Now, they didn't have warheads on them, but it was the nightmare scenario the EMP Commission predicted, you know, that you could put a freighter off the coast of the United States, use something like an SA-2 short-range missile, to launch it, to do an EMP attack, what are they doing in the Caribbean with they say two missiles in the hold of a freighter? This is just, you know, this was just in the summer of this year. The, uh, we'd had incidents happen in this country, you know, m not much reported. I, I suspect there might have been a news blackout on it, but in San Jose, California, earlier this year, uh, I'll call them terrorists. You know, somebody used AK-47s, did a very professional job cut the 911 cables and attacked the EHV transformers outside of San Jose, California. Tried to destroy 15 transformers. This, these supported the Sil Silicon Valley. They got away with it, you know, because they did such a professional job of it. Used AK-47s again. Uh, the, uh, that was followed up by a, an, an event. Uh, it, 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 this was a good news event, actually. There was an American blackout National Geographic documentary. You know, I can put that in the positive column of things, think, things that happen. Uh, but in the negative column, the very day, this was uh, shortly before Halloween, that on a Sunday, that National Geographic ran American Blackout, which demonstrated very accurately, you know, uh, what, what could happen in a, a protracted blackout uh, by a cyber attack. And uh, the electric power industry tried to denounce it and suggest that it was exaggerated, and yet, uh, it was perfectly consistent with all of the major U.S. government studies, you know, that showed infrastructure collapse. And ironically, ironically, 
that very morning, that very Sunday morning, before American blackout ran, uh, terrorists, uh, the Knights Templar drug cartel in Mexico, deliberately blacked out uh, a province in Mexico, put 500,000 people into blackout so they could cut off the communications to the federales, go into the towns and villages, and drag out into the public square and execute about 13 of the pol political leaders and village leaders who were opposing the drug cartel in Mexico. So that, just last month, that was just last month, the bad guys are already attacking electric grids and bringing them down just across our border. Now, what are we doing? How, how well are we doing? Well, the best news we've got, you know, has been mentioned already. You know, thank God for Andrea Boland and, uh, and, and Sid Morris. You know, we've got a bill passed through Maine in three months after trying unsuccessfully for five years to get a, uh, a bill through Washington. It took Maine three months to say, this is a serious problem. We've got to do something about it. And, uh, and Maine is on the way to top, becoming the first state in the union to harden its electric grid you know, against a nat nat natural and nuclear EMP, unless North Carolina beats them to the punch. Because uh, last Tuesday, uh, well, this Tuesday, uh, Jim Woolsey and I went down to address the North Carolina State Legislator Joint Economic Committee and uh, Energy Committee. And they, too, want to pass an initiative. So it sort of ref restores my faith in democracy to see that the states get it, that it, it, the system does seem to be working at the state level. So that gives me some hope. But I don't know if it's going to be fast enough, given how fast the, the threats are evolving. Uh, and in the Hill, we are still fighting at the national level. The SHIELD Act is not dead, you know, but it has been stuck in the House Energy and Commerce Committee and has not been brought up for a vote. So the chairman will not let it come for, up for a vote. It's stuck there for two years. Even though if this thing came up for a vote, it's almost identical to the GRID Act, which passed unanimously. When, uh, when, it, when it came up for a vote in 2010, but was stopped by one senator. Um, just before Halloween, on October 30th, uh, uh, Trent Franks introduced uh, the Critical Infrastructure Protection Act, you know, which will introduce, which would require, if it passes, and it, it has the support of Chairman McCall, so I expect it will pass at least the House, this is, would be a giant step forward, you know, that would introduce a 13th national planning scenario focused on EMP. All federal, state, and local emergency planning, training, and resource allocation are based on these national planning scenarios, so it's a very significant development. Uh, PPD-8, Presidential Policy Directives 8 and 21, have been mentioned, and they are good policy, and they are applicable to hardening the grid, but neither the President or the Congress can require the private sector-owned utilities to harden the grid. That's why you need the SHIELD Act, and this is not a this is not a sustainable or acceptable situation for our country to be in from the point of view of this former CIA analyst and person who has always been concerned about our national security and I hope patriot that, that the survival of nine of ten Americans you know, should be contingent on the proprietary interests and business interests and showing them that they can make a profit and using moral suasion to persuade the North American Electrical Liability Corporation to do the right thing. No, I'm a Tea Party Republican, but here's where government does need to come in and kick some butt. That's why we need the SHIELD Act. If they are not, not doing it, and they're not doing it, they need to be compelled to do it. At the N NCSL yesterday, Andrea Boland, you know, we knew the resolutions would go down to defeat, but at least we began the process of introducing, you know, resolutions to try to get the NCSL to support you know, the SHIELD Act. Uh, uh, we actually, it went off better than either of us thought it was going to. So there's progress there, and we will continue to wor work at the state level. But one of the things that's so discouraging is how, you know, the private, the, the, the utilities don't get it. Uh, you know, they were there in force. They were there in force in North Carolina, too, agitating against us, trying to stop progress on hardening. And, and here was one of the, a, a a study, a, a uh, information sheet that was circulated you know, basically by the NERC, you know, to educate the policymakers there on EMP, which basically says, don't worry about it, we're on top of it, you know, we're going to protect the grid. And uh, in this thing, there's a statement that says, well, you know, even we don't really have to worry about uh, a, a high altitude EMP uh, attack anyway. We don't have to worry about EMP because if, if terrorists or Iran or North Korea detonated a nuclear weapon 
in a city, the blast and thermal effects would destroy the city and kill everybody, and the EMP is the last thing you want to know about, which shows that just as they were oblivious, they didn't even know about that situation that had happened in Mexico when they were criticizing the National Dra Geographic. They don't understand the fundamental fact that the kind of EMP attack we're talking about is a high altitude attack. There is no blast and thermal effects. It's only in the EMP. And, uh, uh, you know, ignorant armies, you know, are preventing us from getting this country protected, but they have many lawyers and deep pockets. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you and good morning. Is, uh, my name is Rick Waggle. I work for the Office of Energy Infrastructure Security for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And although I'm not directly involved with reliability standards or their enforcement, I'm here today to speak on some of the uh, efforts that have been going on at the Commission regarding geomagnetic disturbances. And uh, with that is I guess I have to make the disclaimer that the views I express are my own and they don't necessarily represent those of the Commission. That in May of this year, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission issued an order requiring the development of a reliability standard to protect the bulk power supply from the impacts of geomagnetic disturbances. Before I discuss the details of the order, it's important to understand the, the authority that the Commission has relative to the reliability of the bulk power system. Traditionally, the Commission's role has been in regulating the wholesale transmission rates, but wholesale transmission rates, but in 2005, Congress enacted the Energy Policy Act. That, amend, that amended the Federal Power Act to add Section 215. This section gives the Commission its authority and jurisdiction for the reliability of the bulk power supply. That section defined the bulk power system is to mean the facilities, control systems necessary to operate an interconnected electri electric transmission network. This also includes any generation connected to that network that's needed for the reliable operation. It doesn't include any distribution facilities. The bulk electric system is not defined in Section 215, but it's used by the, the industry to define what is covered under the reliability standards. And in general, is excluding distribution systems, is it's the system rated 100 kV and above. There are some exclusions to that. Section 215 also authorized the Commission to certify and have jurisdiction over an electric reliability organization. The purpose is to develop and enforce reliability standards to provide an adequate level of reliability for the bulk power system. In July of 2006, the Commission certified the North American Electric Reliability Corporation as the ERO. Now, a reliability standard is defined as a requirement that provides for the reliable operation of the bulk power system. And a reliable operation is defined in section 216, 215, excuse me, <coughs> means the operating the bulk power system within limits to prevent instability, uncontrolled separation, or cascading failures as a result of a sudden di disturbance or unanticipated system failure and a GMD event could be described as a sudden disturbance and there's also indications that it does damage power system equipment. Some things to know about the Commission's role as related to the reliability standards are that the Commission does not directly write or modify the reliability standards. That's the job of the ERO. The Commission can direct that the ERO develop a standard to meet a certain need as was done in the case of the GMD standard. The Commission can only approve or remand a proposed standard submitted by the ERO. The Commission must approve any reliability standard before it becomes enforceable in the United States. And a standard cannot include any requirement to enlarge or construct new capacity. The Commission's recent order is designed to protect the bulk power system from the impacts of geomagnetic disturbances. And it is meant to provide a framework that sets the high-level goals of what's to be achieved by that standard. 
the order does not prescribe any specific methods for mitigation and leaves the how to up to owners and operators it allows the flexibility and the design on the part of the owners and operators to tailor solutions to meet their specific needs the order does recognize the need for coordination among all entities geomagnetic disturbances are not a localized events event and finally the goal of the GMD order is to maintain a reliable operation of the bulk power system under a severe GMD impact the order itself was designed to allow the standard to be developed and implemented in two stages the first stage requires the owners and operators to develop and implement operational procedures to mitigate against the effects of a severe geomagnetic disturbance. These procedures are seen as an interim step until more effective long-term solutions of stage two can be developed. Stage one also requires that these procedures be coordinated across the region and that the restoration plans that the, that the uh, utilities have account for any equipment that could be damaged or unavailable due to a geomagnetic event. The time frame we're looking at is six months for the standard and six months after commission approval for the implementation of that standard. Stage two directs NERC to submit a reliability standard to consist of two parts. An assessment phase to conduct vulnerability assessments based on the impact of a benchmark GMD event. And an implementation phase that develops and implements a mitigation plan based on the results of the vulnerability assessments of assessment on the first part. The second stage is also to specify the severity of the GMD event and define the characteristics of the benchmark on which the systems will be assessed. The order sets some expectations in that the standard should contain a uniform evaluation criteria, should evaluate both primary and secondary effects, and it should evaluate the effects of GIC on other BPS or bulk power system equipment. So far, the focus on BPS equipment has been on transformers, but it is known to affect other equipment such as breakers, generators, CTs, PPs. It's also required to assess the impacts <coughs> on a wide area regional basis, and it's to be periodically updated as changes in technology and systems happen. For the second stage, NERC has 18 months to draft the standard that considers a multi-phase implementation approach and prioritizes components that are vital to the reliable operation of the bulk power system. With that, is, uh, I'll turn it over to my partner, Dr. Chris Beck of the EIS. Thanks, Rick. Uh, my name is Chris Beck. I'm the uh, uh, Vice President uh, for Policy and Strategic Initiatives at the Electric Infrastructure Security Council. Uh, EIS Council is a 501c nonprofit, uh, non governmental organization, and our mission is to host discussions and provide education and information uh, to that, that's directed at uh, electric grid resilience for. Uh, electromagnetic threats uh, that we've been discussing today, EMP, space weather, uh, and uh, other threats that, that could damage the uh, electric sector. Um, tr in the past, uh, EIS's uh, sort of flagship activity has been hosting uh, international summits. Uh, we've hosted four. Our fifth one will be in June uh, in London. They've bounced back and forth annually between London and Washington, and they were originally uh, attended mostly by government uh, agencies, so there was a, an interest, I think, that sprung from the, the EMP Commission report among uh, legislators and government uh, uh, officials in both the UK and the United States. They said this is a, an international problem because all electric grids uh, physically operate the same way. There are differences uh, that I'll get into in a second. Um, but the physics and the technology and the science is basically the same throughout the world. Um, and 
we'd like to have an international discussion on this. Well, if we try to go and do an official government to government um, uh, setup of some kind of meeting like this, it'll take about 10 years. If we set up an NGO and ask them to host it, we can probably do it in 10 months. And so EIS Council was born and we, we uh, held the first summit and we've held the three subsequent summits. Um, Dr. Egley this morning talked about, um, well, meetings are great and summit discussions are great and this is a great meeting as well. And it's an important aspect of this issue is to get together and to share ideas and to try to broaden the, the number of people that know about this issue. As Peter Fry pointed out, there's still a lot of ignorance out there. The spectrum of, of knowledge to ignorance is, is complete. Uh, and the people that really understand uh, uh, are, are on, the, on the very tail of a bell curve on one end. Um, we, through our summit series, we did notice that, that the coalition is broadening. Besides government, um, industry has become more involved. Uh, the last couple summits, we have had uh, a very strong uh, interest from the international insurance sector. Lloyds of London has now commissioned two reports, and <coughs> we had a, a roundtable discussion as part of that the last summit. And in fact, Lloyds is hosting uh, a meeting uh, this coming January as kind of a midterm continuation of that roundtable discussion. And the, the global insurance sector is really looking at crafting products. Uh, that address this risk and how to categorize this risk um, that will, we think, add a new dimension, which is a, you know, an economic driver uh, for power companies uh, to look at as they are making decisions about whether to include uh, uh, GMD and EMP effects. Because just to date, it just hasn't been a, you know, a, 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 a factor in their decision uh, metrics. And so having something, uh, an insurance product perhaps that says, well, you know, if you look at this and you do certain things, maybe you get a better price on your insurance. And if you don't, maybe you don't. Um, now you have an, a, a new economic incentive that wasn't there before. So that's, that's a development. Um, uh, other, uh, EIS Council wants to branch out and to provide more operational type of support to um, the private sector and the government. And we're, what we're doing is uh, we have a program called the Electric Electromagnetic Threat Protection Handbook, or EPRO Handbook. And the, the idea is that it would be something uh, where there is some real operational ability for someone to pick up this manual. And it, it will be a living, breathing document. It's not just going to be a, a handbook that we, that we send to people and they put on a shelf and forget about it, we hope. Um, but we're, we want to engage, uh, because this is a societal-wide issue, um, we can't just engage the electric power sector. Um, <coughs> if you look at the whole spectrum of, um, you know, be before event through an event happening to response and recovery, all uh, the, the number of people involved in such a wide, uh, that would be involved in such a widespread power outage is pretty much everybody. And so we're not just talking to the electric sector and we're not just talking to the federal government. We want to talk to state and local governments, um, local first responders, uh, NGO community, uh, which will also be involved. And in a wide scale power outage, all of those people um, will have actions that will build off of their traditional roles of say recovery from a hurricane, but it will be a different environment. The, the biggest uh, challenge being that um, most natural disasters are are somewhat localized and there is an inside of the event and an outside and um, command and control is usually set up outside the event. You can evacuate people to an unaffected area. Well, a nationwide blackout, everybody's on the inside. There is no unaffected area. And so we just have to think about um, how that, how the changes, the mo modest changes to and, and supplementation of, of uh, traditional activities could be effective in helping to prevent an event and better respond to, to it. The overall idea being increased resilience. Now, the first step that we took uh, in this EPRO package was uh, a, a report that we did. It's called the International EPRO Report. We, uh, we worked with the Department of Energy on it. And um, what it is is, a, is an 11 nation survey of experience with and uh, uh, actions taken for geomagnetic disturbances and EMP. 
and uh, it's not it's not a highly technical manual. It is uh, we, we've submitted it for the conference proceedings. You can also find it on our, our website, uh, eiscouncil.org, uh, under resources. Uh, so I hope you can read it. And uh, we you know we found some interesting things talking about operational level stuff that there are the countries we surveyed different activities going on, some that were quite interesting and unexpected. Um, for example, um, in, the, in the hardware realm, uh, New Zealand uh, has a high voltage DC line that, run, that connects the North and South Islands. And they were experiencing uh, stray DC currents that were going into the transformers on the South Island. And their engineering solution was to put resistors in the grounding path. They call them earthing resistors in New Zealand. But it, it diminishes, it doesn't completely block, but it diminishes those currents going into the transformer. Well, it turns out that this has an ancillary benefit for geomagnetic disturbances, which are also quasi-DC currents. And so as we're looking at possible, say, technical solutions, and would grounding resistors work? Well, Transpower in New Zealand has 20 years of experience of using grounding resistors. So let's ask them, you know, what their what their experience is. How did it affect their system performance and so on? So there's there there is some experience out there with these things. Finland has a very tough uh, system. They use uh, solely uh, a specific kind of transformer it's called a three limb core form transformer, uh, which is noted by uh, transformer experts as be the most resilient to quasi-DC currents just because of its configuration. They have uh, what are called series capacitors on all of their 400 kV transmission lines, which is their extra high voltage line. Again, the series capacitor was put in place uh, to help fine tune the efficiency of the transmission line. So that's the main reason that, in, that, that uh, power grid operators use series capacitors but because it's a capacitor, it blocks DC current, so it has an ancillary benefit. Um, so we find examples like that. Uh, the, the Israelis have done a, a full-scale model of their power system to analyze their vulnerabilities, and they will be looking at uh, ways to, to protect their system, um, gathering information from, from these other countries. Uh, so there's some information there, and we hope that, that for example, sharing, sharing information like this will help governments to governments and power companies learn that there are solutions out there. There's no one on the planet who has it completely nailed. Um, Norway has a, a regulation in place very comparable to the one that under FERC Order 779. It is completed, so they, they have a full-on uh, regulation that says uh, Stotnet, which is the uh, national transmission operator in Norway, you know, shall protect the system from GMD and EMP. It's not very prescriptive, but it does have a requirement for them to do so. So um, the, the US grid is 10 times bigger and 1,000 times more complicated than any of these other grids, basically because most of the countries that we looked at have one government agency, one transmission company, um, one set of regulations, and the United States has thousands of companies, 50 state uh, public utility commissions, federal uh, authority and, and, on, and our federal authority is, is, is unique with the FERC-NERC partnership that, that Rick just described, that, that you won't find that anywhere else in the world either. So our, the challenge in the United States is, is technically and governmentally more difficult, but we believe that there are some lessons learned here, that these are good laboratories to look at to others that have had experience and are having some successes. As I said, no one's bulletproof, um, but learning from each other, sharing information, we hope that all the, the, the electric grid power grids of, of the United States and our, and our allies will be better protected. Thank you. Hi, my name's Jim Woolsey. I was director of Central Intelligence uh, in the Clinton administration for two years back in the mid-90s. Um, I think uh, it's important to try to get inside the heads of enemies and potential enemies of the United States in order to assess whether there really is the possibility of an EMP uh, attack. 
because one tends to, in the halls of academe and among journalists and everywhere else, say, ah, this is pretty theoretical. And anyway, nobody's really crazy enough to attack like that. They'd get wiped out. So why are we bothering with this? And the answer is, I think, twofold. First of all, the practicality of an attack. An EMP uh, attack does not require, indeed it is not even useful, to have a large blast or to have accuracy on a missile uh, or to have high yield. None of those is necessary or even useful. An EMP attack could well take place simply by putting a small, simple nuclear weapon on a satellite, launching the satellite, if one wants to be particularly cautious, around the South Pole, a fractional orbital bombardment system, rather than over the North Pole, where all our defenses are. And then as that weapon comes around on a satellite, say 200 miles altitude, simply to detonate it over the center of the United States. No accuracy, no uh, requirements for um, um, particular uh, types of reentry vehicles, shielding, none of that. So we are talking in the first instance about a relatively simple process. We know it can be done, both because uh, um, uh, coronal uh, events uh, have triggered electromagnetic uh, pulse uh, uh, activities which are similar to what would occur in a nuclear uh, blast. And also, we had atmospheric nuclear blasts at approximately the right altitude to test this concept back in 1962, right at the end of the period when we had atmospheric tests. The Russians played more, paid more attention, I think, than we did, but there is data that suggests what would happen uh, with, let's say, a 200-mile high uh, detonation. Uh, and uh, no reasonable and persuadable, uh, with evidence, uh, scientists or military strategists that I know of denies this. One gets a lot of arm waving, but the people who really know, including the commission, uh, do not gainsay that problem. What you tend to get is the idea that, well, you know, the North Koreans and whoever else, the Iranians, once they get a nuclear weapon, they're not crazy. They don't want to all die. Well, and they would suffer retaliation. So let's forget about this. This is just a subcategory of, uh, of nuclear deterrence. I don't think so. Uh, in the first instance, one can conduct an EMP attack, again, around the South Pole, without giving away who one is or where one is coming from. There is no particular reason for the North Koreans or the Iranians, once they get a nuclear weapon, to do anything to indicate who is detonating this weapon above the continental United States. Second, people tend to say, well, you know, the North Koreans aren't nuts. I beg to differ, depending on <laughs> your definition of nuts. Um, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, we know from the Soviet database that Castro worked very hard to try to get the Soviets to use a nuclear weapon in the Cuban Missile Crisis, and he knew it would result in the destruction of Cuba, and he didn't care. And he was not even a religious fanatic. He was just a fanatic. So if one looks at Iran today, one could have... Um, an ideology that is stimulated by some religious views, particularly the extreme Shia, to the tune that it would be a good idea to have a worldwide chaos and lots and lots of nuclear weapons going off because from their point of view it would mean they go to heaven and we go to hell and they each get 72 virgins and we, got, we die. From their point of view, both on the Iranian side and on, I think, the North Korean side. One cannot assume that just because someone is not a raving lunatic 
just because they're not ranting in the streets, but rather they think like Castro did in 62, or they think like perhaps Khamenei does today. If they think that way, they could well be very interested in an electromagnetic pulse attack, particularly if they think they can hide where it's coming from. And they write about it all the time. This is not something that has been dreamed up. It has been subjected to very careful analysis. Uh, uh, Peter has been involved in much of it at CIA and elsewhere. Uh, and uh, those people who say nobody could be crazy enough to try something like this are not students of history and they are not people who have made a careful examination of the problem. They are people who are trying to wave their arms and wave the problem away. So I will each wanted to only take about five minutes here at the beginning and so I wanted to at least at the beginning touch on this issue of possibility of decision making in a rogue state leading toward an actual launch of an EMP uh, uh, attack. Uh, one cannot, with any reasonable attention to history or the nature, such as during the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, or the nature of the, the weapon, come to the conclusion that this is just some fanciful subcategory of nuclear deterrence. An attack of this sort is much easier than most nuclear attacks that people talk about, which require substantial accuracy and a number of other characteristics that are not required if one is going to fire as an Iranian leader or a North Korean leader or whomever a nuclear weapon at the United States in an EMP mode. Now, we have a few minutes for questions, but what I'd like to do is have the first questions be from the panel amongst each other. Uh, you might have an interest in, uh, in uh, clarifying or asking a question of someone else in the panel first, so I just want to make certain you guys get the first shot at each other. I'll, I'll pass and ask you another question. Uh, could you pass the microphone to Congressman Bartlett? And, and I'll take questions, by the way, in the middle in a little bit. I have perhaps okay. naively assumed that uh, whereas these regimes are evil, they were not suicidal. Mr. Woolsey may be correct. They may, in fact, be suicidal. But even if they are just evil and not suicidal, we still are at huge risk because there are ways of uh, producing an EMP where we would not know who the perpetrator was. Uh, a tramp steamer. A scud launcher, which you can buy for about $100,000 in the open market, any, any crude nuclear weapon. Uh, it wouldn't take out the whole country, but it would certainly take out the, uh, the, the, from Boston to Norfolk and, and uh, uh, west uh, to Pittsburgh. That could be a fatal blow to our country. If they miss their target by 100 miles, as Mr. Wilson was pointing out, it wouldn't make any difference. It would still be just as effective. And then the ship is sunk. There are no fingerprints. As a matter of fact, it doesn't have to even be a country that does it. It could be a non-state actor that does it. Since all you need is a tramp steamer, a scud launcher, that'll go 180 miles. That won't cover the whole United States, but it'll cover enough to be really, really hurtful to us. Is this not realistic? I think it's... Uh quite a realistic uh, a threat, and the anonymity, it, as you mentioned, and I had as well, is uh, an important uh, uh, part of it. Uh, it's important to realize that during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and people have now interviewed the uh, uh, sort of squadron uh, commander of the nuclear submarines uh, uh, off uh, Cuba, the, the, the Russian nuclear submarines, we know for a fact that the Cubans and the Russians were requiring, in order to launch one of their new nuclear torpedoes, which were on a couple of submarines, in order to launch one of those, they needed three votes. One vote was from the party chairman for the submarine squadron. One vote was from the squadron 
commander. All three of these people were Navy captains from the Russian Navy. And uh, the third was the ship commander of the ship that had the nuclear torpedo on it. We know for a fact the commander of the submarine that had the nuclear weapon on it pushed his button and voted for that nuclear torpedo to be launched at American ships. We know that the party leader for the squadron, the Communist Party leader, pushed his button and voted for the nuclear torpedo to be used. One guy stood alone, he was the Navy captain, and he was the commander of the Russian uh, submarine, I think he was the squadron commander, the one who voted in favor of it was the, the uh, submarine commander. But he was the one, one of the three, and he voted not to launch the nuclear torpedo over the objections of the other two Soviet naval captains. This, you cannot predict who is going to be suicidal, who is going to be merely evil, uh, who is going to be some combination of the two, who is going to respond to culture and tradition, and who is going to respond to direct orders in a circumstance like that. But people at, including one at the Kennedy School and others, who wander about conferences and so forth and say, well, of course, this is crazy and nobody's going to be crazy. Like I say, they need to examine their definition of crazy because as uh, Hamlet put it, it is entirely plausible to be mad north by northwest. I think Mr. Woolsey is correct that the uh, thinking in many of our leaders is that, uh, that the uh, consequences of launching an attack like that would be so devastating to the person that launches it, nobody will do it. And what uh, Mr. Woolley is pointing out is that that may not be true. But, you know, they don't have to put themselves at risk to, to uh, do a, a, a nuclear EMP because there are many ways that they can do it and leave essentially no fingerprints on it. Weather balloon works fine. Uh, I have a question. We may have time for a couple of questions from the audience in a moment. Uh, I know that th there was a lot of discussion about the importance not only of uh, getting federal uh, level uh, uh, development, protection, regulations, legislation passed. We also talked about Maine and what can be done at the state level. And I was also uh, wanting to ask about the technology end of this. So we have large regional electric grids that need EMP protection. But it seems like uh, one of the other things we might consider is the development of local power generation and storage that could be developed all across the country, even by many of the communities and individuals represented in this room. And there may be some practical things that local communities can do long before Washington and the large utilities can do what they need to do. So the question I have for the panel is, uh, what are your opinions about what might be done with local power generation and storage and the EMP protection of that? Now, I was born in 1926, and I lived through the uh, Cold War. And those of you who did that can remember all of the fallout shelters. Now, you know, bombing us was not going to end life as we know it. But we had drills. I worked at the National Institutes of Health. We had drills there until the hydrogen bomb was developed, and then we might have been in the fireball, so we stopped having drills at the National Institutes of Health. Building 10 was going to become a large casualty hospital if that happened. And uh, Chuck, I've been very interested in the psychology. Everybody was involved in that. We had drills at school. You had drills. You knew what you were supposed to do. You know, and that didn't even come close to the life-changing effect that an EMP attack would do. Why are we today doing essentially nothing compared to what we did. Then there were fallout shelters with food stored. You couldn't go into a public building without getting a brochure telling you what you ought to be doing and how to do it. Why is it so darn different today? Uh, I think it's probably because of the uh, massive uh, cost of protecting against an EMP uh, uh, shot. Uh, that massive cost was uh, laid out clearly, uh, and I've got my tongue in my cheek, uh, by the commission that Roscoe and Peter had, had so much uh, to do with. Uh, the cost would be uh, up to protect and put the resilience into the system that you need. 
would be approximately uh, 20 cents for each electricity consumer uh, in the United States. Um, if you go to a uh, Starbucks and uh, look at the coffee cup prices, a uh, macchiato is the most expensive uh, uh, small coffee, and it's uh, $3.95, whereas for $1.95, you can get a small uh, plain espresso without the macchiato flavoring. So that's a $2 difference in price. Well, if you will just, next time you're at uh, a, a coffee house, if you will just sip uh, a, an espresso rather than a macchiato, uh, you can save uh, uh, $2, and that would be the contribution that would uh, be uh, uh, required by 10 people uh, a, in order uh, uh, to make uh, uh, a, uh, a contribution toward protecting, uh, substantial contribution for those 10 people of uh, protecting the grid against uh, EMP. Uh, so whenever somebody from um, electric power industry or otherwise tells you how, what a big deal this is and how expensive it is, uh, go to the report, find out where it says 20 cents uh, uh, per uh, consumer, and uh, uh, hand them a copy. If I think we need to put this cost in perspective, I seem to remember that we had a stimulus package that cost, what, $1 trillion? The numbers I get is that this would cost maybe $2 billion. I think there are 1,000 billion in a trillion. So the cost of doing this is absolutely inconsequential compared to the money that we spend on other things. It has to be more than just costs that are deterring us from doing this. Because if you put this in context, the cost to prepare is really pretty darn small compared to the money we're spending on other things, is it not? It's tiny. And uh, uh, what this is about uh, is power and not only in the electricity sense. It's about who decides. Does the electric utility industry get to decide whether their facilities are, are protected or not? Or uh, do they uh, get to, as they are now, uh, resist doing anything that anybody outside tells them to do because it might say, save our civilization? doesn't matter, they would lose power. They would lose the ability to decide whether or not that 20 cents per person was spent or not. And from their point of view, that is a very bad thing. It, it, the, the 20 cents uh, uh, cost is not the issue. The issue is can somebody tell them that they have to take a protective step or does, do they get to do whatever they want, even if they're putting the country and our civilization at absolutely huge risk? That's what's at issue. Any of the other panelists want to chime in on that or what local communities might do? Or And I, I, we have a couple over here. I'm going to walk the microphone to them. You can make a comment before I get there. Okay, we have two right here in succession. Identify yourself and then your question. It's, it's Hank Cooper. I, I think I know most of the people on the panel. I appreciate the fact that you talked about the uh, threat of a nuclear EMP generated uh, attack. Uh, and I wonder if you could address the, um, the issue that I run into a lot, because that's an issue I care a great deal about is, uh, in defending against, in fact, with active defenses. Uh, people don't want to talk about that, and they think EMP is an excuse to uh, build ballistic missile defenses. And, and that's why we're talking about this issue. And so generally when I say what can be done about the threats you described from missiles off our coast, and particularly the Gulf of Mexico where we have absolutely no defense, um, I, I, I believe we have to have a hardening of the grid because all, no defense is perfect, but we have to do the defense too. And the fact is that there are components of the electromagnetic pulse that uh, you know, we have to deal with that come from nuclear weapons that we don't get there, get from uh, some of these other threats that you're talking about. So I wonder if you could address the psychological issue that we're ran, running into in discussing this, uh, what I consider to be the most comprehensive threat uh, to the nation, and people don't want to talk about that because they think it's, uh, I don't know, too hard or too difficult or, or whatever, which is also nonsense.
something that we really can't defend against. Um, and I, I think that there is some resistance uh, in certain circles of, of looking at, at nuclear EMP because um, sometimes it's viewed as a stalking horse for uh, reviving our own offensive nuclear capability, things like that that people are shying away from. And I also have heard um, from the electric power sector forward with the FERC order, but it, it's on geomagnetic disturbance only. It doesn't include EMP. And the kind of thought process there was, well, this is the electric power sector. They're not war fighters. They just provide power. So, you know, nuclear EMP is a national defense issue. And so that's beyond our scope, and someone else has to deal with it. Um, but the fact is, uh, no one else can deal with it. But you're absolutely right. Hardening uh, and being ready Uh, every question that's going to be asked will, of course, spawn five more and lots of interesting discussion, and that's why we're all here, so you can get to know each other and continue to this discussion. Uh, but because we're going to try to keep things on track, I'm going to give uh, the mic to one more questioner. Identify yourself and ask your question. Tom Popek, Foundation for Resilient Societies. There's a persistent rumor that Iran already has tactical nuclear weapons uh, purchased on the black market uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, which would mean that they could have an EMP capability right now. In the opinion of the panelists, uh, is this potential EMP capability of Iran affecting the Obama administration's negotiating strategy with Iran, its willingness to conduct a military move against Iran, and also um, the decision of President Obama in 2009 uh, not to support uh, the Green Movement, uh, which would be a potential regime, regime change. Well, I'll, I'll take that because thank you for throwing me the softball because I wrote an article about that that got published last Friday. And the short answer is yes. Uh, but I would like to follow that up if I could break your yes. rules, Chuck, because I have a question. I have a question. And I look at this room. You know, uh, I'm, I'm seeing in this room, like in those three chairs over there, and Cindy Ayers and Claire Lopez over there, Frank Gaffney in the back, and Sid Morris and Andrea Boland. I mean, it's amazing how much progress has been made by a handful of people, a handful of committed activists who've made tremendous sacrifices. Everybody on this panel, it's just a handful of people. And we've been trying and largely succeeding. Not fast enough, though, not fast enough get this country protected. I have a question. And my question is for you. You people who have contributed, you know, you know who you are. Those uh, the rest of you who are in this room, I know you're here because you at least care about it. You care about it or are curious about it. Please ask yourselves, what can I do? What can I do? We need your help. We need your activism and commitment. We need your brain power. I'm not the smartest guy in this room. There's a lot of you out there who probably are a lot smarter than me that can bring insights, talents to our, to our cause. I would ask you to go to our Uncle Sam, Frank Gaffney, Jake Berman. They've stood up a EMP coalition that's looking for volunteers. You know, if America's going to get protected, guys, it's not going to happen from NERC and the electric power industry. And unfortunately, Congress has tried and can't do it. The President has tried and can't do it. It's up to you. It's up to you, just like in the old days. You know, when, uh, when, when, when rugged individualism and self-sufficiency, the kinds of values that established this republic in the first place, it was expected to be sustained by the onion and farmer and the small shopkeeper. And I believe that that kind of spirit, that kind of American spirit still exists in this country. So I, I, that's if, my question. If I could say a word in answer, yes, in please. response to the question that yes. he asked. Um, I don't know. Uh, of anything uh, plausible that suggests that the Iranians already have a nuclear weapon purchased from Pakistan or whatever. It's not impossible at all, but I, I don't know of any 
the evidence to that effect. Uh, I do think people underestimate how far along both the Iranians and the North Koreans are to being able to launch an EMP a a attack. The North Koreans have nuclear weapons and they are the right size, small yield, large uh, uh, gamma ray production um, for an EMP attack. Uh, they have uh, orbited uh, satellites, so the, the, the nuclear capability and the, the, the satellite launch means that, as far as I'm concerned, they have the capability. The Iranians um, have not yet, as far as we know, detonated or have a nuclear uh, weapon, but they have orbited satellites. So, um, including both the North, North Koreans and the Iranians have orbited shooting to the south, as would be the case for an electromagnetic pulse weapon uh, that is, uses the fractional orbital bombard bombardment uh, uh, orbit uh, that the Soviets uh, basically invented and we believe now have handed off to the North uh, Koreans and possibly Iranians. Uh, so um, we are, whether the Iranians have a nuke yet or not, uh, they are at most a few months away uh, from being able to have one. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, possibility that they ha can have one very quickly or already have one and it could be an EMP weapon is, is uh, definitely plausible as far as I'm concerned. I'd just like to note that uh, the North Koreans have had uh, tests where the uh, uh, rocket uh, uh, missile blew up above the atmosphere. We have said, gee, they really screwed up and that's a failure, isn't it? Jim, if you wanted to do an EMP attack, that seems to me to be a big success, isn't it? 200 miles uh, altitude is about right. That was the Iranian. Yes. Uh, the Iranian. Tucker, I'd just like to say in closing, there are three levels we really ought to be working at in a, in a matrix. Uh, the one I mentioned was, you know, your family and so forth on up. But the other is we need to protect ourselves if we can. Our military is trying to do that. They cannot possibly be totally successful. So knowing that they cannot be totally successful, then we need to do the other two things. We need to harden the grid. And that's the primary thing we're focusing on today. What do you do there? The third thing that we need to do is what if those first two things don't happen? What if they can't protect us? And what if it happens? Then what? Shouldn't we have a pretty aggressive effort at every level so that we can be survivable? By the way, you're not going to be attacked where you're strong. You're going to be attacked where you're weak. Isn't this where we are potentially the weakest that we could possibly be in this area? Doesn't that invite attack? Uh, so now uh, we're going to conclude this panel, but so you're aware as we take a break, it'll be an opportunity for you to talk to each other, but coming up will be a presentation on latest information on space weather. We're going to have presentations this afternoon on business models that can cost justify uh, local power grids that would be EMP protected. You could figure out which ones actually make financial sense now so you could limit the amount of subsidies you might need. Uh, so we'll have a whole series of presentations throughout the day that will answer a lot of these other questions. We're going to take a quick break now, but let's thank the panelists for their time this morning. Thank you. Five-minute break. <laughs>